welcome to this webinar hosted by the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Today, in the next hour, we're going to be speaking about health systems performance assessment and how it informs policymaking. My name is Deepa Rajan. I'm a newly joined member of the observatory team. And we will have today a fantastic lineup of speakers. Our keynote presentation will be done by Irini Papanikolas of Brown University in Rhode Island in the US. She's a professor of health services policy and practice there, also newly joined. Previously, she was with the London School of Economics and where she spent several years, 10, 15 years, working on many topics, including health systems performance assessment. Irini is also the lead author of our recently released health systems performance assessment book. And uh, we have also co-author of the policy brief, which we recently released just last week. And that the content of that policy brief and the book, which is a new framework for health systems performance assessment, is what Irini will be presenting. We will, be, we will have, following that presentation, a panel with three great speakers, um, all uh, with a strong background in, in a country context. We'll first hear from Tavi Lai from Estonia who is an experienced senior policy advisor who's worked not only in the Ministry of Social Affairs in the eHealth Department of uh, Estonia, but also in uh, for WHO, the European region. He's done a lot of consultancies with the Eastern Mediterranean re region as well, also in this area of health systems performance assessments. We'll then he'll hear from Julian Perelman of the National Institute of Public Health of Portugal, um, where uh, health systems performance assessments are conducted regularly, so we'll hear about that experience and how it links or not to uh, health policy and planning. We'll also hear from Lina Kaisa Tinkinen from Tampere University, Finland, who also holds a position in the uh, THL, the uh, local institute, um, public health institute. Um, Lina Kaisa is an assistant professor in health and social policies. She's uh, led a research program on sustainable welfare system. She's uh, contributed to the reflection process in Finland around the current health systems reform where health systems performance and assessment plays a key role. Um, so we can kick off straight away uh, with our keynote presentation and I hand over, hand over to you, Irini, go ahead. Today I'll be talking to you about the, the recent book and a uh, newly launched policy brief uh, on health system performance assessment and uh, what we can learn for policymaking. So you can see the images here on the slide. And these are both free to download from the observatory website. So I want to start with just quickly talking about uh, what this framework adds to the HSPA space. So the framework, the HSPA framework, for UHC is really meant to assist policymakers in examining the performance of their health systems. Um, and what it adds kind of to this space where there are already kind of uh, health system frameworks in existence is bringing together two elements of frameworks that are really important um, for health system assessment and for thinking specifically about how health systems can find areas for improvement um, for performance of their health system. Uh, so the two areas are the health system functions, which we'll go over shortly in this presentation, but really thinking of what the health system does and the key actions um, uh, that it operates and the, the performance of the health system itself. So the addition of the framework is, is trying to explicitly kind of link these two areas together. So when we think about the actions that the health system does, we think about how those influence the performance of the health system itself. Um, and the framework aims to, to draw on a lot of thought already from this area in terms of what those functions are, how the objectives we assess the health system, what those are, how we assess them in terms of indicators as well. Uh, and the framework aims to signpost where this information exists and what indicators can be collected from already existing health system assessment tools um, that have been developed for other purposes, including health system performance uh, assessment, but also the description of a health system, informing reforms, um, and we'll, we'll look at those objectives as well in the slides to come. So our starting point was these tools. There are multiple tools for health system assessment. There's also multiple health system frameworks. Um, 
And we we didn't want to reinvent the wheel in in kind of bringing this framework uh, together and creating this new framework. What we wanted to do was synthesize what we already know uh, and and contribute to where we thought there was a gap, which is linking some of this information together. Uh, the ultimate aim was that people can go to all of these prior tools and look at the information that exists there and that using the framework that we'll present to you, kind of see where they fit in into this kind of consideration of health system performance assessment so they can identify both how their system is performing, but also where potentially to look for areas of improvement. Um, and so these multiple HSA efforts that you saw on the previous slide, um, as I mentioned, they they exist but have different objectives than, than the one of our, our framework. Um, some have been created to describe a health system or a number of health systems. Some have been created to think about health reform and, um, uh, and in a country or across countries. Some have been created to monitor health system functions or describe health system functions. And there's a few that have been created also to assess the performance of health systems. So they provide information and insights, if you like, at different parts of thinking through a health system, either in the objectives of the health system and measuring those are also kind of thinking about what the health system is and how we can describe it. And so our starting point was, how do we use this information um, and pull it all together with the objective of assessing health system performance and identifying areas for improvement for policymakers? So the fundamental premise of, of our framework is that, and I think you all agree, that the attainment of health system objectives is linked to having well-performing functions in the health system. Uh, we also believe that the functions and the performance of the health system functions, these actions that the health system does, can be assessed. Uh, and we also believe that the performance of the health system itself can be assessed. Therefore, the framework kind of building on these three assumptions really tries to showcase how we measure the performance of the functions, how we measure the performance of the health system, and how one is linked to the other. Therefore, helping policymakers identify if we believe, for example, health improvement is not performing well, what are the areas that we should look to in terms of what the health system does, and what are indicators that we can use to identify how to improve these areas or if these areas are performing well. So our objective in doing this was to draw on existing work as much as possible so that when we're defining the areas of performance that we're measuring or what the objectives of the health system are, we're not reinventing anything. We're taking uh, objectives that have been introduced in prior health system frameworks. We're thinking about indicators that have been used to measure these from existing work. When we're thinking about the health system functions, again, we're building on a lot of information that already exists in terms of how these are conceptualized and how these are measured. Really, the innovation here is bringing the two together. Um, so to achieve this, we reviewed and incorporated concepts for numerous past and existing efforts. And you can see these detailed in both of the publications, the book and, and, and a summary of this in the policy brief as well. So let me come to the framework and spend some time talking you through this. Uh, so hopefully also you see some of these concepts kind of again in, in these images and this looks familiar, but also you can see what's new about the framework. So really here on this slide, you see the health system, kind of this, this colorful part um, in the middle uh, with the greens and the, uh, and the oranges and the reds, um, which represents both the functions uh, on the, this side of the framework. We have four functions building on the conceptualization of the fu functions introduced in the World Health Organization um, framework and report in 2000. Um, and these are the functions of health system governance, resource generation, financing, and service delivery. And then you see how through a series of links, which I'll go over in a later slide, they kind of translate into these intermediate objectives um, and then into the final goals of the health system. But really what's, what's important to take away about this initial slide is where the health system sits. And it sits in this kind of broader, I guess, purple area, which is a broader context, a broader country context that's um, shaped by many factors, uh, socioeconomic factors, political factors, cultural factors. And the and we've seen in recent years and, and in the past that there, there can be shocks to these areas too, which will influence the health system. Uh, and these are important when we think about things like sustainability and resilience. Also the health system itself while it has its own goals, which we'll go over in a second, is, a, is one of many, I guess, institutions in a country that contributes to some broader socio 
societal goals, which we also have kind of here in this box that sits outside the system. Things like economic development, social cohesion, well-being. So, you know, it's important to remember the context of, of where the health system sits in, um, to think about also the external uh, factors that will influence um, its performance. And of course, because the health system has an important role of influencing as much as it can some of these factors, because they will influence also um, some of the goals of the health system. So for example, if we think of health attainment or health improvement, um, as we know, there's many socioeconomic factors that are important in influencing um, health outcomes. And, and there is a role of the health system through the governance function it for through policies such as health and all policies to, to shape and, um, and try to influence change in the socioeconomic determinants of health, which in turn kind of go back and influence this health system uh, um, outcome of health improvement. And so you can see this link kind of um, depicted in this uh, view of the framework where it goes outside the health system to influence um, a health system outcome. But uh, let's go into more detail of what's inside the framework as well and kind of thinking through um, the, the health system and its um, presentation. So I've started here with just presenting um, the green part of the framework from the previous slide. So here, this, these final goals um, and zooming in on them a bit uh, so that we can just go over them. And again, you can see that these are not new goals. They're goals that if you look in the past, uh, a lot of health system frameworks that come prior to ours have been represented again and again. And, and there's a lot of consensus that you know, these are, are some of the key objectives that health systems have. Of course, health improvement is one, and you know, ensuring that the health system is uh, is conferring health to its population, um, people centeredness, so that people's individual rights, needs, and preferences are respected uh, in their receipt of care, financial protection that's protecting the population from some of the financial risks of ill health, uh, and then these two cross-cutting goals, which you can see um, portrayed kind of here across uh, some of the other goals because they run um, across the health improvement, people-centeredness and um, for equity, also financial protection, we think of health system equity, such as reducing the variation in these outcomes across different population groups and health system efficiency, which is when we think about providing kind of health improvement and people-centeredness that we do this in a way that we use resources most efficiently. So we're maximizing the health improvement and people-centeredness that we can get for our investment and really minimizing waste in the system to do this. But of course, to achieve these final goals, we also have to achieve some intermediate goals. People in order to get health improvement and to have people-centered care also need to have access to care and, and need to experience good quality care. And here again, um, kind of we build on a lot of frameworks that exist in the space of quality and access to think through how these are presented. Quality, as you can see, is presented in uh, with a number of kind of um, different uh, intermediate goals in mind. So when we think of quality of care, we think of providing effective care, safe care, you know, making sure we're providing good user experience in the receipt of care. And again, these two cross-cutting objectives, similar to what we saw in the final goals of doing this in a way that's equitable across groups that are receiving care um, and efficiently in terms of uh, ensuring we're maximizing these given the resources provided. Some people um, wonder how is this equity and efficiency of kind of service delivery different to equity and efficiency of the health system? I think maybe the easiest way to think of this is that you could have a hospital that does a great job of using its resources to produce great hospital level outcomes operating in a health system that isn't allocating its resources efficiently. And, and so it's, it's a question of the unit of analysis that's different here. Here we're looking at uh, the providers within the system at the final goals, we're looking at the entire health system itself. Um, as you can see in the image here, we have access represented as another box, but this box uh, goes outside the borders of quality. This is meant to represent that in order to receive good quality care, you need first to have access to care. And so that's why you have this positioning to illustrate that point, which again has been um, discussed and presented also in prior frameworks. And then we come to the functions. Um, so these functions are also not new. As I said before, they come from um, prior thinking and really most closely resemble the functions introduced in the, the 2000 uh, 
WHO framework. Um, we have governance uh, of the health system as one of the functions, resource generation, service delivery, and financing. Uh, and as you can see in uh, the image here, the governance function kind of overlaps a bit with the other three functions of resource generation, service delivery, and financing. And uh, what this is meant to represent, and you can see also in more detail in both the book and the policy brief, is that an important function of governance is also the governance of financing, the governance of service delivery, and the governance of resource generation, as well as the governance of the system itself. And that there are distinct ways that we can also think of the performance of governance of each of the other functions that are important to consider and assess when we're, we're thinking about uh, what the health system does and, and how to think of if these functions are performing well. So in terms of kind of thinking of the, the performance of the functions, for each of the four functions, uh, we develop and, and um, think through of the sub-functions, so the specific actions that um, each function takes uh, to achieve its its uh, its objectives, and for each of these sub functions, we try to think of ways that we would assess uh, the attainment in this area. And so, this doesn't have to be in terms of the final health system goals. In fact, it probably shouldn't be if you're thinking about, for example, how well uh, revenue raising is um, uh, occurring in financing. You're not going to assess that with health uh, outcomes. You're going to want to look at specific indicators related to 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 that um, particular area of performance. And so here we think about how would you assess how well each of these subfunctions are performing? And for each of these kind of assessment areas, look back to all of these existing health system assessment frameworks to try to identify routinely collected indicators that already exist and can be used to evaluate these assessment areas. So that when we think of the health system and how well its actions are performing, we also have a body of indicators that we look to try to identify, you know, what are the potential weaknesses in, in the financing function? What are the potential weaknesses in our research generation function? And, uh, you know, how can we find, use these assess, indicative measures and assessment areas to identify where we might find areas for improvement in the health system itself? And then importantly, the performance link, which is this last bullet point, and you can see kind of coming out of these functions in the image, are the links between the performance of the functions and then the intermediate and final goals in the framework. And so this is where you say, okay, I, I identify that this one assessment area maybe isn't performing well. What is the potential for that to influence my intermediate outcomes and my final outcomes? And if you follow the links, that... Um, that tells you some of the potential mechanisms or the potential ways to think about how those are related. So you can see this on kind of this big picture of the framework, which is, uh, if you like, the central fold of the book, um, which brings everything together. Uh, it brings together the final goals and the intermediate objectives, which we went over earlier on in the presentation, and, and the functions with, in each box, the sub function. So these are the activities taken in each of the functions to achieve their objective. And you can see um, that governance sits in all of the other functions because we, as we said, an important function of governance is also the governance of each of these other functions. And then in this yellow box, you see the, the assessment areas. So um, I think my example was, how do you assess revenue raising in financing? You can see here, you know, some of the proposed assessment areas that we put out are that you have sufficient funds, stable funds, um, and equitable revenue raising across your population. And then if you go to the chapter on financing or look in the, the policy brief, we would have specific indicators that you could use to try that already exist to try to assess the performance of kind of these areas. And then you have these links that are color coded with, with each of the colors of the, the different functions and go back to the intermediate objectives and final goals. And you might be surprised that even though this framework is quite noisy, you don't see so many lines. Maybe you were expecting more lines between the, the functions and the intermediate and final goals. And the reason is because a lot of this goes through the service delivery function. So a lot of the how well financing governance resource generation is performing ultimately will influence how services are delivered and then service delivery is assessed through these intermediate objectives. So a lot of the links are kind of through 
different steps in the health system. But there are also direct links. We talked about one through governance, which goes outside the health system, through the kind of socioeconomic determinants to influence health improvement. Another example, if you look at people-centeredness, you see another blue line to governance. Sorry, you could think of that as stakeholder voice and how much um, different stakeholders in the system, and such as uh, people and patients, are able to influence kind of the health system, and that directly influences people-centeredness. There's other links you can see, the yellow line from financing going to efficiency, you know, purchasing plays a, a large role, for example, in price setting that's going to directly impact the efficiency of the health system. Um, and so you can, you can see these other links that are described in much more detail in the book. Um, so really, that's kind of a, a very short snapshot of how the, uh, the framework works um, and the, the many different components, but that which portrayed all together in this image might look quite um, messy, but we hope uh, provide an intuitive way to think of how you can assess the functions themselves, think of areas of improvement, and look to the framework to think about how those might impact the assessment of the health system itself. Um, so just some final thought before I wrap up. The framework, as I said before, is meant to bring together key elements from existing work on health system assessment and health system performance assessment. We really tried here not to introduce new concepts, but to draw on the consensus that exists in this space and just use that to really kind of facilitate an understanding of how the indicators that exist can be repurposed to think about health system performance assessment and areas in which the health system can improve. What we think the innovation of the framework is, is making this link more expi explicit and getting people to think of how the performance assessment of the functions is linked directly to the performance of the health system itself. Um, okay, so thank you, and I um, hope I didn't go too much over time, but I'd like to pass over to the Deepa now so that she can continue. Thank you, Irini, and uh, that's a lot to compress in in 10 minutes. Uh, all of you, you've seen all the various boxes and arrows and dotted lines. It's uh, not so easy uh, to take all at once, but we'll try to work our way through it within the next uh, half an hour or so that's remaining to us, 35 minutes. Um, but now we'd like to hand over to our country panel, because what we'd want to know now is, so what does all of this mean at the at country level? How is this, uh, all this data and information used or not at country level? How is it useful? And so we'll start with our panelist, uh, from Estonia, Tavi Lai, who has experience not only from his home country of Estonia, but also several other countries, such as the Ukraine and the, uh, countries of the WHO Eastern Mediterranean region. Tavi, tell us what you think about health systems performance assessments in your experience. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I basically love uh, health system performance assessment and the community around it. It's, it's a great community. So if there's any new people, welcome to the community. It's, it's a really good community. I will mostly talk about the Estonian experience and then link it uh, to the current framework that Irini was presenting. So in Estonia, our path, as much, much as I know, um, doing HSPA started in 2008 in preparation with uh, Tallinn Charter. So a small team in the Ministry of Health started to go through all the national health strategies and the plan was to link all these together because we didn't have an overarching strategy and the plan was that we get a tool where we can look at the entirety of the health system, not separate the strategies. <clears throat> so it's a lot of work looking up indicators and the team was small in the ministry, so it took us much longer than expected, even we had um, WHO, regional office and country office support to do that. But at, during the time we did that, the policy priorities in the ministry changed. So suddenly the priority was to reduce administrative burden. So one by one, all the national health strategies, these kind of detailed specific ones, um, got merged into bigger and bigger, bigger chunks. So in the end, um, we didn't have anything to integrate with them, um, with the HSPA and the ministry itself decided that as I was working still there, that um, it's too much administrative burden to actually do HSPA, um, at least in this manner, um, every second year or so. But the idea stayed with us. 
the, the lessons learned uh, from the HSP process were all channeled into next strategies that we created national health plans. So in that sense, the work didn't uh, go to waste, but as a political window passed, uh, um, the purpose and, and use of the HSPA did change. Um, the leadership of the ministry at the time, and also leadership of various lead, leading institutions in the health sector, were all on board in, in support of the team. And they all had their own books when they were published and did use these in their everyday work, but officially. The HSPA was was closed, and um, nothing much happened in Estonia in this regard until last year or so, when Estonia Minister of Health um, again started to do HSPA in the country. Um, looking from afar, I don't know much about the current process. My impression is that uh, they started a lot of work anew because so much time has passed. Um, Luck, hopefully, they will be able to institutionalize and then implement um, the HSPA in, in the governance system better than um, I did um, manage um, these years ago. But the student initial HSPA also influenced a couple of other countries, uh, their HSPAs, and uh, in some cases, the results in the other countries were, were much better um, uh, than in the student case, in a sense that it got used much more than in our case. So that brings me to the current um, new health system performance framework Irini uh, presented. One thing we struggled initially when we did the first decision one was to create and understand, first of all, the, all the functions in health system and how these link together, how these interact, etc. So for me personally, Reading the book the Observatory published, it, it, it was a good reading for me, even though I worked with health system frameworks and HSPA stuff uh, for years. Um, it, 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 for me, it was a really good explanation. And I was wondering how much easier would have been the work I did in 2008 and nine um, compared if I had that kind of guidance document. Yes, I guess I would have contextualized the framework even then even if I had the current uh, framework, but the understanding uh, would have been much better because at the time I had, to, we had, I and, and, and the colleagues had to piece together the function stuff and indicate the stuff and everything together bit by piece, uh, bit by bit. And that was a huge load of work. So in that sense, I'm really happy to see the new uh, framework coming out. So, <clears throat> and one of the things, I want to leave with you is based on our external experience and my experiences with other countries, uh, Slovenia, Malta, um, Pakistan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is that there's a need to find a ways to make it useful for policymakers. In a certain case, initially the policymakers were interested. At the situation when we had several national st uh, strategies that need to be linked together and, and measured as a whole. But the window of opportunity passed for various reasons. And, and that kind of use of that kind of windows of opportunities and make it useful for policy system, policy makers is an important part as in any development in health system, I guess. Also, if you were able to institutionalize the health HSPA in your system, in your country system or regional system or wherever you do it. Um, so it's regular, there's a stuff, there's a community around it. Then it has much more chances to influence the policy. So look for ways to make it part of the governance system itself. Um, that would, uh, in my, uh, when I've helped other countries, that was, has been one of the messages try to wait, make it part of the governance system. And as I said, try to create a community or take part in the communities. Um, in Europe, I know there's a really great community, people I've interacted even now several 10, 10 years after the initial HSPA and we've become good friends. And, also, and finally, use a new framework to ease your 
load to get the understanding and approaches. And when you learn, understand the bits and pieces, why the framework is done in a way it is, then when you master that, it's easy to contextualize it for your own context. Um, one of my surgery, uh, I, I was supposed to become a surgeon. So one of the um, supervisors told me when I asked, why do you do it differently surgery than in the book? They said that, okay, you know, you know, need to learn it by heart before changing it. But when you learn it by kind of know it to the details, then you understand it completely. Then you can start changing. So in that sense, the current framework put, gives a good opportunity to understand it uh, really well. They have system frameworks. Thank you. And apologies for over time. Thank you, Tavi, for those insights. You raised some very interesting and important points. Uh, the fact that in Estonia, it was a, a big administrative burden to do the HSPA in depth, at least every, every couple of years. But at the same time, when a window of opportunity presents itself like it did last year in the post-COVID context, that idea is still taken up uh, again to, to do these assessments. And you also raised this issue of institutionalization. So even though the administrative burden is high that there needs to you know one needs to perhaps find a way to do it um, more regularly perhaps in a more light touch mode um, in order for uh, the information and the insights to be actually taken up in in policy um, on that note i'd like to hand over to julian perelman from from portugal um, where these assessments uh, performance assessments are done more regularly so julian tell us uh, about that experience in Portugal, and are they taken up in policy? Over to you. Thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, so I, I will talk a little bit more about the, the, this translation about efficiency measurement and performance measurement of the health system, how this performance it translates into, into specific policies. I divided my, my presentation into two, two topics. The first one is that the, the Portuguese health system has been subject uh, many times to reviews of its performance by external entities like the OECD, the European Observatory. I give here some three examples, three recent examples, so the health system in transition, the country health profile. These, these evaluations, they are uh, very appreciated because they allow to identify priorities, like, for example, the fact that they, uh, they, they calculate the measure of the burden of disease, uh, the measure of the inequalities in health, they, 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 they describe the organization of the health system and its main weaknesses. But uh, in the way they do that, so it's very easy, it's very interesting to identify priorities, but it's interpreted in different ways. So each one receives, uh, who receives a report, uh, interprets the results in different ways and, and draw different implications in terms of policies, in terms of recommendations. Um, I must say that uh, these reports have uh, so this is a subjective view, of course, but uh, the visibility is quite weak of this report. So it's it's read in a restricted academic groups, is uh, accessible to people, to decision makers, but the visibility is quite low in the general population, even in the health sector in a wider way, it's the visibility is quite low. So the impact, in my view, is quite limited. And this impact is also limited because, of course, uh, these, these are more overviews, a picture at a given moment of the health system, but it doesn't bring us uh, specific recommendations or politic insights, political insights for action. Then there is a second group of, of uh, evaluations of the health system, which has been done at specific moment uh, regarding specific issues and that been performed by specific people. Uh, one uh, was related to the political and economic context. So the memorandum of understanding during the Great Recession in, in Portugal in 2011, uh, there was a bailout by international institutions and re, uh, related to this bailout, there were austerity measures that were imposed to Portugal. And these austerity measured, measures included a large chapter 
on the health system, an overview of the health system and specific measures to be, to be taken. Uh, there was also a, a very interesting report in 2014, Future of Health, which also provided an overview of the health system and a series of recommendations. And the, the interesting point is that this overview, this, this Future of, for Health report was uh, the, the leader of this report was Nigel Crisp, who was a former executive director of the, uh, the uh, English NHS, but it also involves uh, many Portuguese people, many specialists in Portuguese, many, many experts who collaborated to this report. And then uh, there is what we call the spring report. The spring report is a report that is performed each year. Uh, it, it's released generally by mid-June uh, or by the end of June. And this report uh, is, provides also an overview of the performance of the health system, but also develops specific topics, like for example, the, the drug market, uh, the inequalities in health, uh, the COVID response. So specific uh, topics that according to the circumstances and to the, what we consider are the priorities. And this report is, is written by people from academia, but it's written for the general audience uh, in a non-technical non, uh, uh, language. And, it, and like the other ones that I presented above, it has, uh, it, it's grounded on a critical perspective of what's happening in the health system. So it's not just about providing an overview of the health system or an overview of the health of the population, but also to be critical about what's happening, to provide interpretations of what's happening and to draw political uh, policy recommendations. So it's used to, to alert the population for specific issues and to provide some specific tools to the government for action. So uh, these reports uh, of the reports of this type have a high visibility because the media talk about that and the general population talks about that. Uh, so it's, it's highly visible. But uh, I must say that the impact in terms of changing the policies, except if we talk about the case of the Troika, about the austerity measures that were really imposed and that had to be uh, implemented. In the other case, the, the Niger Chris report or the spring report and they have very little short-term impact. So uh, many people talk about the recommendations. Uh, uh, the ideas are there. They are under discussions. Uh, the policy implications are discussed. But of course, uh, in the short terms, uh, what we see is very little uh, changes uh, and very, very, very little uptake of these recommendations. But um, the ideas remain there. So if specific topics are raised, like let's say, for example, the, the, the necessity to change, the, to, to, regu to better regulate the drug market or to better regulate the, the interaction the between the public sector and the private sector, um, or the, I, the, the, the fact that we should, more, we should focus more on, on preventive measures. These ideas remain there and are, token over, are, are talked over and over until at a certain point, not in the short term, but in the medium and long term, they end up being implemented. And this, this is something that we have seen, for example, in the case of the COVID that uh, in, a, in a situation of high stress and strong difficulties, some measures that had been proposed, uh, been proposed in 2014 or even uh, earlier than that have been implemented in, because of these specific circumstances. So when there is a feeling of urgency and there is a political momentum, these ideas, they, they do their way and they, they end up being, uh, being very effective and being implemented. So, uh, if you now talking about the specifics of the HSPA about your proposal, my suggestion, if I, if I can draw, do, do a suggestion, is really to, to go further and to go beyond just the overview of the health system 
and to to go into the interpretations of what's happening and to draw political recommendation based on that and to work with uh, local experts who can really help give visibility to what's, be, what's being said and to translate this recommendation into real practice. And thank you once again for inviting me and for your patience. Thank you, Julian. Um, that's an important and interesting point you made that uh, really it's about not an academic exercise per se, but ensuring that that academic exercise is linked to a policy process that we that uh, HSPAs um, are done with policy actors and uh, with local contextual interpretation. Um, you also raised a very important and interesting point that sometimes the policy uptake happens at a different stage and not exactly when the assessment is happening because it, hap it it's taken up when there's a window of opportunity, but only when the HSPA is institutionalized and done more regularly so that the same results and insights keep repeating over and over again. Uh, with that, um, we'll hand over to our Finnish colleague from the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, Lina Kaisa Tinkinen, who this institute is tasked with doing HSPAs and these new well health and well-being counties that will launch in January and also at the national level. What are the plans there? And um, tell us a little bit about the policy context. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here and to discuss what's happening in Finland. Um, I want to acknowledge my colleague Vesa Surya, who, who is actually part of the team doing the HPA at our institute, uh, for providing me some details. But what I'm trying to do is to look at the HSPA uh, uh, as part of the Finnish uh, health system as all, and also as part of the reform. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we are doing in Finland at the moment is a big health, health system reform. So as of uh, January next year, we are centralizing our both the provision and organization of health services, health and social services, actually, uh, to the um, 22 um, health, uh, well-being services counties. And also um, the funding will be centralized to the state, state level. And this is the process. Uh, this reform process has been going on for a long time, and now we are finally implementing it. And what has been one of the issues in the Finnish health system for a long time is the lack of national uh, governance or, or national steering. And now as part of this reform, and also link with the aim that we should also be able to steer the health system also at the national level, uh, the government has introduced this health system performance assessment uh, tool in the reform. And it has that, been tasked to THL, which is the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, to do annual uh, uh, national assessment and also um, regional assessments uh, to every uh, well being services county. And these evaluations then are used in two ways. Uh, of course, the well being services counties, these new entities which will in the future be responsible for organizing the services. Uh, these counties can, of course, use these assessments to develop their functions and to, de to develop their services uh, to improve them, but also as a basis for national nego um, uh, annual negotiations between the counties and the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health. So in the reform, uh, they are introducing this kind of a tighter link uh, between the counties and the state, and this health system performance assessment uh, is included uh, in the negotiations and as a tool, as, as a one tool and source of information that the, this, the, the ministry can use to steer the counties uh, towards the actual goals. Uh, the scope of the evaluations vary uh, annually. Their, the scope is quite uh, wide and the ministry um, has uh, big expectations to that, uh, but taking the resources that the team at THL actually has, it might, it might be that, that not all the aspects are covered every year, but that the, there will be focus areas for every year. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so uh, this is a rather busy slide, but the idea is to show that 
uh, in the, um, the, the basic knowledge base for evaluation is uh, uh, an indicator bank, which consists of uh, over 400 social welfare and healthcare cost eff effectiveness indicators. And they are called UVA indicators in Finnish. These indicators describe uh, various functions, uh, which, uh, which or, in, or in Finland, they are called functions, which is a little bit in a contradiction with the HSPA framework, we just, uh, that was just represented. Um, and the functions uh, that they call them uh, include uh, services such as primary care, specialist care, elderly care, and things like that. But also uh, some of the, um, so, so the functions relate a lot to the service delivery, uh, but also to, to funding and costs, for instance. And then there are certain dimensions that are looked into, which include uh, um, description of service needs at the counties, um, use of services, level of integration, um, equality, um, socio socioeconomic and regional disparity, uh, disparities, etc. So, so my description would be that that in Finland we have um, a lot of so the the HSPA has now been integra integrated in policy processes, and there is. Uh, will to actually use that knowledge also to steer the health system. But as you can tell from this slide, if you can read it, <laughs> uh, it's, it's so small. The, the approach that has been used in Finland is a little bit maybe a theoretical in a way that it has not been uh, done in a way that, for instance, was uh, described by Irene uh, before. And, and I hope that in the future, we could be able to integrate the whole data, the, the data we have uh, and maybe rearrange it in a, in a little bit different way so that we could actually um, do, do this kind of, um, we could even use the framework that was now presented to evaluate our system even better um, in the future. But this was the uh, greetings from Finland and, and uh, over to you, Deepa. Thank you so much, Lina Kaisa. And I see that our chat box has been exploding. Um, uh, Erika, Kira, can you maybe take some of the, uh, throw us some of the questions? And I ask all of the panelists and the uh, keynote speaker to please come on video and uh, we'll see if we can take some of these um, questions. Over to you, Erika. Thank you very much, Deepa. Yes, it's been a busy chat box, and I'd like to thank Kira very much for her support <laughs> in the more, particularly with the more technical questions. Um, but just to kick off with a couple of questions that have come up, um, people talked about the reports, HSPA reports, as being shelf decorations, which I thought was a lovely way of putting it. Um, so, do we have any top tips for advocacy for actually getting the this uh, information into to inform policy making. Um, who should be reading these HSPA reports? You know, who are the who are they for? But who should they be for? Um, and should countries do their own HSPA frameworks? Um, or should you know? It, is it, it do these frameworks always need to be adapted? Um, and what scope is there for cross country learning? in health system performance assessment. That's to be going on with, I have more, okay. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Maybe we'll start with the, you know, who should be, who should be looking at these assessments and doing them and how, and how can we make sure that there's a closer link to policy? Can I um, hand over to one of our country panelists? Um, Tavi, would you like to start? And then maybe, then we see if the other two can complement. Yeah, sure. In my case, um, I always have promoted that um, write these to policymakers, but also uh, stakeholders who can influence the policymakers. Um, and it should be clearly understandable, and uh, the narrative should be there. And in our case, the first decision one was maybe too narrative, little data, but at the same time, it made it clear why these things are important. And on the linkage, um, multi-institutional teams are good. 
me, I was working in the ministry at the time. I was engaged in policy making as well. Uh, other people were from national institutes, etc. So that we had we had a, as a team had a direct linkage with with the national policy making. So that was transferred there. Okay, so collaborative work across different health institutions and ensuring that the data is presented in a more policy relevant and less narrative way. Uh, Lina Kaisa, uh, any insights from you? Well, I think that one of the things they've done also in Finland, and I can also put the link to our database in the chat because it's publicly available. And what they've done is that they they are they have two sort of views in the database. It's where, where they have the frozen view, which we often have in health system performance assessments. We have a sort of a cross-sectional view of, of the of, of certain year, for instance, but they also have this currently updating view, in, which enables also the, or in theory at least, it would make it, it possible to also uh, you know, use the data, uh, car, uh, also to make quick changes for the system and, and to, to, to fix, for instance, problems in certain uh, functions if we uh, meet them. Because I, and I, I think that one of the things is that whether we should also be more able to use update or, or update our databases. And of course, I acknowledge I come from Finland where, where our databases are really uh, advanced. Uh, but one of the, maybe I could also challenge whether we should do more you know, online platforms, which could be used also as a tool to steer the system and, and, and also um, have them in addition, in addition to the frozen uh, health system performance uh, assessment books, which are important as well. But that's sort of the approach we've done also in Finland. Okay, so making it not just sort of, um, you know, one-off snapshots, but ensuring current, regular updates and making it really live. Uh, Julian, uh, what are your thoughts from the Portuguese experience? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's really nice the idea to have an external evaluation of the health system. I think that it's clearly more reliable that, than an evaluation that would be promoted by the government, uh, by local authorities, which may always uh, raise doubts. But of course, this external evaluation must be directed to policy makers, decision makers in Portugal. And I think that it's essential to do so uh, to have uh, Portuguese people look, uh, collaborating into the interpretation of the results and to um, providing insights about how these evaluations can be translated into policy recommendations. Uh, so that, uh, uh, because I think that external evaluations, uh, if they remain totally external, uh, there is a high risk that they are seen as irrelevant, as something that has nothing to do with Portugal, uh, done by people who don't really understand the Portuguese reality and so on. So I, I guess that we, we need to overcome these uh, preconceptions about what an external evaluation is. Um, uh, that is something that is purely academic, done by someone, by some people that are external to the Portuguese reality. This is the main challenge, I guess. Okay. Even if I, again, uh, I really think that your initiative is, is absolutely fantastic. Okay, great. So external evaluations and that are more independent and academic are important, but they still need to be linked to contextual realities with Portuguese stakeholders and policymakers should indeed still be, be the target. So it's bring, finding that right balance between the two is really, it seems to be the key. I think we have the time for one final perhaps response. Um, Irini, I, there is a question about cross-country learning. This is a, a special specialization area of yours that you've been working on for a long time, cross-country performance assessment and, and comparisons. Um, what are your thoughts? I think absolutely uh, countries can learn from one another and that we need to do more of that. Um, you know, we've just heard from three countries, that there are three, re you know, representations where I think there's a lot of lessons that, that for everyone, you know, about ways of thinking of kind of redesigning the health system, measurement opportunities, you know, challenges even in the process of undertaking HSPA, which, which are interesting and relevant to anyone, I think, in in the space of health system thinking about how, you know how to 
what are different models that we can learn from and look across to see if they might work for our context and how, you know, how do we translate that into measurement and into change? And so um, by comparing health systems, we have this unique opportunity to look at, you know, hundreds of ways that different countries are trying to achieve very similar objectives, but, you know, with similar challenges, some different challenges, different amounts of resources, you know, structuring systems in different ways. And it seems a shame not to do more to try to learn across countries. I think one of the biggest challenge in doing so is, you know, getting the data together um, from one health system, from a number of health systems. But there's a lot of innovation that's happening now, both in measurement, both in methodology that, you know, is starting to break down some of those barriers. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to soon learn even more from one another. Yes. So yes, to, to cross-country learning, we need more data, um, but things are getting better on that front with the digital age. And I think, yes, cross-country comparisons are important for benchmarking as well, which is uh, which is key to know what the interpret the data. Tavi, one last final word before we move to our closing. Go ahead. Very quick, quick on the last point. I've learned about my own country and uh, health system in Estonia more in other countries than in Estonia. Understanding what has what has bogged me in the Estonian case, um, all these you know, revelations have come in other countries mostly. Yes, yeah, another reason why cross country com comparisons are, are really key. Um, so we're nearing the the end of our hour, and um, we'd like to say that this won't be the uh, the last. Um, webinar on health systems performance. We see that this topic is uh, elicits great interest. We plan to do um, a, a few more next year. We'd love to hear from you what kind what topics within uh, health systems performance assessment you would like us to address, and we will try to uh, try to organize those topics in a webinar format. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot more from us um, early next year with an announcement for further webinars. And also, please uh, do take a look, peruse through the policy brief, the health systems performance assessment book, the links to both of those publications have been put in the chat box. Um, and with that, I'd like to try to close on time and on the hour. Thank you very much for the great turnout. Goodbye.